Coming up on this episode of DL Weekly, some Marvel plans have leaked, skip some lines in Galaxy's Edge, aliens invade, Mother's Day options, Tomorrowland rumors, we talk about the history of Club 33 and more. DL Weekly starts now. Welcome to DL Weekly, a podcast about Walt's original Magic Kingdom, Disneyland. We cover the latest news and information from the resort, test our skills at trivia, and have a discussion about the parks every week. We invite you to send in your feedback and stories. Our contact information can be found at dlweekly.net. Now sit back, keep your hands and arms inside the podcast, and enjoy this week's show. Hello and welcome to this episode of DL Weekly for the week of May 8th, 2019. I'm Teg Bushman. And I'm Teresa Urban. We would like to send a shout out and a big thank you to all of our supporters on Patreon. This support helps make DL Weekly possible. Our patrons get some pretty nice perks like access to our Discord chat, live shows like the one today, and some DL Weekly swag plus more. If you'd like to learn more, head on over to dlweekly.net slash support. Well, have you booked your trip to the resort yet? If not, you should. Contact James and Mike over at Concierge, and they'll take care of your entire vacation from beginning to end. And as an added bonus, you'll get a free year of touring plans. Why wait? Check them out at concierge.com. Well, it's that time of the month again where we get to draw out names for from our patrons to figure out who gets to be our next guest on the show. So I'm making sure I'm mixing them well for you guys. Congratulations to Tim P. You are our next potential guest. I don't want to ever put make anyone feel like they're on like on the spot. You don't have to be a guest. You're welcome to be our next guest on the show. So we will be in contact with you. And stick around for the end of the episode where we pick out our name to see who gets to get some free DL Weekly merch from us. Well, now let's get to the news. Star Wars Galaxy's Edge isn't even here yet, and we're already talking about the next big thing for the resort. Plans have leaked online for the upcoming Marvel Land attraction for Spider-Man. The leaked images show a ride system similar to that of Toy Story Midway Mania. It's not a shock that the attraction that is said to put guests into the role of Spider-Man shooting webs at villains and objects would be like Midway Mania with the ability to shoot rings, darts, and other projectiles at the screens. So I'm a little disappointed by this news. I've kind of been on the bandwagon that I didn't want it to be it, like Toy Story Midway Mania. I'm totally fine with like slinging webs at things. I'm holding out. I'm hoping that the ride vehicles are going to be like out of this world, like nothing we've seen. I really hope it's not going to be just the same thing where you're kind of in a little, I don't know, car like ride attraction vehicle. I'm hoping you're going to be somehow like suspended from the ceiling and you're going to feel like you're swinging back and forth and you get to like sling your webs at things that's what i'm hoping now that for. would be cool because that would add a whole nother level exactly if your cart is swinging it's a more of a challenge exactly so but, I, my fingers are like quadruple plus i don't even know how many times crossed as many times as you can cross your fingers as you can plus toes that our ride vehicles are going to be very very cool i i want to be other, with, if they're not it's not gonna be it's i'm not excited though. i, I want to be with you Teresa, but i just don't <laughs> think that's probably what's going to happen unfortunately so if you look at the uh we have a link in the show notes if you look at the blueprints online uh it just does not look uh like that that's going to be uh like it like it's going to be anything different it's got the same kind of back and forth like midway mania does i'm hoping though i'm hoping um you know it's got uh, you know, it, it's it's two vehicles together, just like Midway Mania. So how do you know it's two vehicles together? Because that's what the blueprints show. I don't I don't see that where. <laughs> well, okay. I'm trying to. We will not. be in denial. It's fine. <laughs> I'm so this is what okay. So if I was the Imagineer and I was designing this ride, could you think about it? If you had a ride vehicle like, um, in. This is not what this podcast is about, but Universal, sure. Wizarding World of Harry Potter. If you had a ride vehicle like Escape from Hogwarts, is so that like what the it's little the Kona arm on thing the that arm. moves around, and if you somehow are on the arm and they made it feel like you were like swinging back and forth. Well, we had that patent thing with that. Like, That's I'm still swinging. holding out hope for the swinging arm thing for the ride vehicle. I do hmm. not want ride vehicles that are on the ground. Yeah. 
Does that make sense? Well, you I know don't what? want to like a car. For all of our sakes, I hope you're right. Me too. <laughs> well, last week, the reservation system opened for guests to get a time slot to enter Galaxy's Edge in the first few weeks of operation. The system launched with very few hiccups. The biggest issue seemed to come when guests needed to add additional members to the reservation and it not being clear enough. Disney has worked with guests that have this issue on a case-by-case basis. In just under two hours, all of the reservations were already allotted. So if you want to experience the new land in those first few weeks, your only option now is to book a room at a disney resort hotel i really actually liked how they did so i don't i didn't have tickets for this period of time but you could go on to the website and you could uh like get in the virtual queue so i went there before uh noon pacific time and i got to the site and it says do not refresh this site do not click away this is uh you know you're you have a place in line and so just wait and some of the people in our chat uh, were able to go and get tickets uh, and get reservations for that time frame. But I'll tell you, about half an hour in, there was already a bunch of time frames gone, you know, a bunch of stuff gone. The first few days were gone, like, almost immediately. And so I'm not I'm not really that surprised. Uh, I, I, I expected a lot more hiccups, to be honest. I expected their servers to have problems. I expected people to be entering in their details and things mm-hmm. to crash and yeah. error out and people get mad. But it worked out really well, although... Um, I, I have to say, it, it, they all sold out in two hours. I kind of expected sooner. So good for them, I guess. You know, though, but I was surprised because I, I was seeing, because I didn't actually go on and look at it, but I saw screenshots of what the time slots and that looked like. I was surprised at how many slots there were per day. I was expecting there to be fewer time slot options per day. So I wonder if that's why it took two hours for it to sell out versus like a blink of an eye like we all expected. But just remember... You can still get hotel rooms at the Disney Resort hotels and and get a reservation. Although I have a feeling that those are all like the very expensive rooms by now. But if you're really itching, if you're really itching to get into the, into this new land, you probably already have your stuff <laughs> taken care of. Well, there's certainly going to be a lot of lines in Galaxy's Edge, but if you want to get food at Docking Bay Seven, Ronto's Roasters, or the Milk Stand, you can skip the line and use mobile ordering. The other locations, such as Oga's Cantina. And uh, Kat Saka's kettle will not offer mobile ordering and open. Uh, another interesting thing about this that we did not, uh, that I didn't put in the script part is you will not be able to do mobile ordering except for when you're in Galaxy's Edge for wow. these places. So they're going to use the GPS on your yeah. phone and through the app and everything and determine. So the the article where I got this said, so you, you cannot be, be in, in Dumbo. Line. Yeah, <laughs> that's for fantasy line, fantasy land and sneak in to grab a milk and sneak back out. Correct. <laughs> so you basically, uh, and I think during the time where there's the reservations, obviously the app knows if you have a reservation or something because of your tickets and all that stuff. And so I think that you won't even be able to do a mobile order not in your reservation time. That frame makes or whatever sense. Well. That makes total sense. I am I'm very happy. I do think that Disney is trying to do as much as they can to try and alleviate the stress for guests for the opening of this new land. I think it's very smart that they're doing the reservation system to enter the land like we've discussed already. And I also think this is great that they're trying to make getting the foods that everyone's going to want to try easier as well. So unfortunately, obviously, there are going to be waits, especially since the attraction, both of them are going to be standby queues only. They won't have the fast passes right when they open. So you are going to have to be spending a lot of time in queues. So it's nice that now you're not going to have to also spend a lot of time in line just to get a drink or to get a snack. Yeah, anything they can do to get people not having to be in more and more lines, I think is great for this. Because there's, I mean, I think you don't want to have your new land people all upset because I had to, not only did I have to wait and have this thing, and I had to wait and stand by for five hours to get on this attraction, but then I had to wait an hour and a half for food or something like that. And then, you know, my kid passed out because it was too hot. We didn't have something to drink, you know, whatever. So... I think that they are doing an abundance of caution. I think that they're doing it the the proper way, the best way that they can with what they've got. I guess. Man, your uh, your little story scenario got a little extreme there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just thinking because there was one time I was at an amusement park and it was hot out, and we we hit a bunch of lines, and I was trying to get water because I was dehydrated, and I did pass out. I had heat stroke in line. Oh. So personal experience. <laughs> 
<laughs> you're drawing from per I was like, that was a really, wow, that was an extreme story. Where did that come from? I just could see it happening. It gets now hot we know. California. Now we know. <laughs> well, the Orange County Register this week found some patents that give away the names for the upcoming beverages in Galaxy's Edge. Some of the items include the White Wampa Wheat, Bad Motivator IPA, Gold Squadron Lager, and Gamorian and Trandoshan Ales. There will also be some wines with names like the Imperial Guard and Carillion Red. Yeah, so they some of these were actually previewed um, at a press preview back in February, and so they kind of have some descriptions at the link in our show notes for the Orange County Register, um, and then uh, but the names are kind of cool. They're great. So this I did not put in the script, but I think you will like this, Teresa. So what is one of the favorite things that you see when you go into Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Breakout? What's like Me personally? Well, like what's the thing in the queue that everybody always thinks is so Herald? awesome? Harold. Harold. Okay. Do you know what a you know what a wampa is, I know, right? So, yep, I know. It's the best like sleeping bag. <laughs> what? <laughs> <That's a> Tom <taunt laughs> oh, Never mind. Oh, oh. The wampa the wampa <laughs> oh. Producer James is having an aneurysm. Oh. <laughs> do you want to unmute That's your mic and what what do you say it is? So what's a wampa? The wampa is the creature that captures Luke and brings him to the cave and eventually oh. spoiler alert for a very old movie, gets his arm <laughs> chopped off by a lightsaber gotcha. that Luke uses the force to pull. Gotcha. The poor, tauntaun is the sleeping bag. Okay. At least poor on wampa. The same planet. Just so, trying to get Luke out of the cold. So the, the, <laughs> so the cool thing about this is the fact that they're going to have a full-size wampa in oh, cool. the second level of one of the establishments. So very much like Harold. Yeah, so I thought that that was super cool because I've always wanted to see, and it's going to be like over seven feet tall. Wow. So I'm excited. So what, okay, where's the wampa going to be? Did you tell me where? What I did not, be? but here, I can. I, I will tell you. Give me one second. Okay. It's going to be in, in the upper balcony of Doc Ondar's Den of Antiquities. Oh, that makes sense. Den of Antiquities. Yeah, so wampa, not... Sorry, guys. I really feel it's Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing that was in our trivia question. I could not. Tonight. I could not believe that producer James just had like an aneurysm oh off the side. Oh my gosh! <laughs> this is like the one part of Disney that I know I have you two beat on knowledge, yeah. and so me you're just for sure. Maybe me. not Tag, but one hundred percent, you have me beat. Uh, James he, has got me too because he plays he plays yeah. the Star Wars Galaxy of Heroes game, which has all types of characters like I know nothing about, but like our Star Wars universe people. So James always knows those. Yep. With the popular Star Wars Day of May the 4th, Hyperspace Mountain has returned. There's no word yet on when the attraction will go back to the classic version, but online speculation points to it hanging around until after Galaxy's Edge opens, possibly even until the Ghost Galaxy overlay for Halloween shows up. You know, I think that I, I'm excited about this. I, I really enjoyed this when we went on it last year. I think hyperspace is really, really fun, really cool. Even if you're not a Star Wars person, it was just cool just to, to add some thrilling kind of elements. ride through it with the space battles. That was just really neat. Um, but I think it makes total sense. Get the hype up for Galaxy's Edge. Why not? Yeah. And the other nice thing, too, is you keep the hype going, keeping it open, you know, until through the summer and into like almost before Halloween until it becomes the Ghost Galaxy. I think that makes sense, too, because there's going to be a lot of Star Wars hype in the park. Unfortunately, not everybody's going to be able to go over to Galaxy's Edge and be in there as long as they want so they can still get a taste of Star Wars there. I think that they're by doing that, they're catering to a lot of the Star Wars fans that are going to be in the park that probably don't normally visit Disney. Well, that's what I'm thinking is that Star Tours and Hyperspace Mountain are going to be just crazy town when nobody can get into Galaxy's yeah, Edge. Yeah, yeah. So make sure you get your fast passes for those two attractions you now. Know, this, this brings <laughs> up an interesting point. I wonder how many people that are not as connected as we are with all of this. I wonder if people are going to show up in the beginning of June, let's say, when they have the reservations and expect that they could just go in this it's, land. You know, it's very possible. I wonder how many, I would not want to be a cast member at City Hall. Uh, no. No, no, they're going to have a very tough job, I think, for the next couple of years. <laughs> Let's well, be honest. Months for sure, but probably years. Yeah. Well, I know this next story is really exciting to you, Teresa. It is. 
It's not Star Wars. <laughs> the emotional whirlwind attraction themed to Inside Out in Pixar Pier is getting closer and closer to opening. This week, the center of the ride system and some of the guest vehicles have arrived on site. Now that the foundation has been completed, it seems construction has really sped up. So true. It seems like it took them forever and ever and ever just to get the pad yeah. That it's going to be on ready. And then boom, the like theme wall just kind of popped out out of nowhere. And ever since the theme like. wall popped up, it's just been like boom, everything boom, boom, else boom. has just went boop, boop, boop. So, you know, it's weird because I feel I felt like this was going to be a very quick turnover since basically they were just gonna re-spin yeah. an existing attraction. But it seems like they're do it to me it feels like they're doing more than that. So I'm really excited now, for this one. I will say something that I thought was super cool about this is I looked at because the ride system is being installed. The, the vehicles have not been installed on it. There are crates next to it that the right, ride vehicles yeah. are in. I will say I did go back and Google Flix Flyers. And honestly, I you wouldn't even think it was the same attraction. No, no it looks very different. Yeah. Are you excited to ride this, actually, when I we am, go? I am. I am. I assume it'll be open by then. I really, I really like this movie. It, it's got a special place in my heart. I don't know why. It's just... Gives you it's all the, the emotions. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just excited, and it just for such a simple attraction, the um, the 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 theming, I guess you could say, is just so immersive looking to me. They've been doing that a lot though, because Jesse's Critter Carousel. Yep. that is such. A, it's such again, very simple, basic attraction. It's just a carousel. We've seen them all over the place, right? No, wrong. This one takes you like. Feels like you're in the Wild West. Feels like you're with all the cute little critters and like in the world of Jesse and the prospector and Woody. So, so I now, think it's very, very neat that they're doing so much with just little things. So here's a controversial question for you. Do you think that Disney should have waited and spent the same amount of care and time that they have these things that open after Pixar Pier to get... Do you know what I mean? Like, do you think they should have waited and spent more time on the other aspects of Pixar Pier that opened in June yeah, and made them better than they are. I see what you're saying. This is my thought process. I think they did this. I think how they did it is okay. I think they got the big attractions flopped over pretty quickly. Not the best, I don't think. But they got them that done. They got them open. So they got their ride capacity back up. They took time and care with these simple, more simple attractions and they're making them more immersive. So perhaps we're going to see the Incredicoaster go down for a refurb and it will get the rest of the TLC to kind of Maybe. bring it back up to par with how these other attractions are coming out. Maybe. I hope so. I, I mean, mean, really the only thing that I think needs to be plus, I think they need to plus the Incredicoaster theming a little bit better. Yeah. And I don't think it would take much. I yeah. mean, I haven't ridden it, so I don't know from personal experience, but from photos and videos that I've seen, you know, I think it could do, I think it could be a little bit better. Yeah. But then the other thing too is you're going how fast and you're zipping through these things. And so how much focus are you really, you know, am I picking up these details because I'm looking at still photos versus going past it at like right. 40 miles an hour or whatever it is versus, you know, I don't know. Right. We will be the judge. When we are there in August. That's true. Well, for the past month, the back patio section of the Hungry Bear restaurant in Critter Country has been closed off to guests with a lot of questions on what's going on back there. We know now that a shade structure is being installed into this extended patio area. The extended area is expected to be a popular spot on the way to Galaxy's Edge this summer. This is right at that, at that particular entrance to Galaxy's Edge. So I think people that maybe uh, later, once the reservations are done and people can just go into the land and out of the land, I think people will come out and, you know, because those eateries and whatnot in Galaxy's Edge are going to be busy, they're going to come mm -hmm. out to Hungry Bear and they need a lot of room and stuff for that. So uh, I, I like this idea. I think it's going to be nice. Uh, I feel like Hungry Bear for me has always been really underrated um, by me even because I just forget about it because it's so far back there in Critter Country. Uh, and of course, you pass through. New Orleans Square to get back there, and New Orleans Square has excellent so food. much cool stuff. So. Yeah, it's yeah, and that's kind of what makes it so awesome, though, is that not so many people go there. So I feel like when you do, it, it's kind of a destination, and when you do make the choice to go there, um, you know, I think it's kind of it's like a hidden gem, I guess would sure. be a good way of saying it. So it'll be interesting to see how much more traffic it will get now with being one of the main entrances. Yeah. Well, it's for definitely the new land. It's definitely built to handle a yeah. lot of oh, people. Oh, definitely. And it just yeah. never 
had the opportunity to. It is nice. I, I haven't eaten there. We did hang out on the patio and the deck once. I don't remember what for exactly. But it was just so, it was one of those nice and calm and peaceful spots. And you have a very, had a nice overlook of the Rivers of America. And it's just, you kind of felt like you had your own little corner of Disneyland over there. It was nice. Yeah, the one thing I miss is gone forever now. But uh, it used to be the downstairs patio section was a nice shaded area that was always cool in mm-hmm. the summer. Yep. And it would get a nice breeze from the river and you'd be right there on the river. Well, now the path to Galaxy's Edge is there. So you don't have that same riverfront yeah. direct viewing. Well, as May charges along, the Sleeping Beauty Castle refurbishment continues. It should be wrapping up just in time for Galaxy's Edge to open at the end of the month. This last week, even more of the new paint can be seen if you look closely for it around the non-fenced off areas of the castle. I'm still just getting so excited for this and can't wait to see it when it's completely done and I don't have to like peek around things and can just see it in, in total. I will say I was very pessimistic about this when they showed the concept drawing and I was really worried that it was going to be too terrible. But now (laughs) that I've seen pieces, the turrets that are in front of the castle Mm -hmm. that house the projectors, those things have been out. They look great. There's some sections that you can walk through um, going from one section of uh, the park to another that are, that have been painted. Uh, The front benches and stuff are getting painted. So I'm very excited to see this when we go. Uh, One of the things that somebody brought up on some forums I was looking at was, uh, that maybe they they are painting it such bright colors because they know that in Southern California, like it fades so fade, quickly yeah. that when it fades, it'll still look way better than it did before because it's so bright. I think so. Well, time will tell. Well, the scrims around Red Rocket's Pizza Port have confirmed that the temporary name change to Pizza Planet uh, for Pixar Fest is going to be permanent when the walls come down for the exterior refurbishment. The new location will have a slight name change to alien pizza planet mm-hmm. i don't think it's all bad i you know i have mixed feelings really i do um because i feel like i've said this before i feel like since we have two dedicated areas now for star wars and for especially pixar i can make a little bit of an argument with the star wars stuff because you've got different whatever but um different times different places so it could be in two different spots it's hard for me to justify having pixar and toy story so prominent in two different areas because it has the whole pier area. So I wish that it would have just continued. I mean, I thought it was very cute. I did like the aliens flying around. If, you know, them making it more permanent, maybe it'll have nicer um, theming and, you know, better decorations. I don't know. But it just, I'm just a little disappointed that it's Toy Story and more Pixar outside of Pixar Pier. Well, even if the gods are angered by all of the celebrating, well, it won't matter because you are going to have the new Tiki Room inspired rain gear. I am stupidly excited for this. <laughs> the new gear includes an umbrella with Jose on the handle and a raincoat. Both are very vibrant, green with a decorative Tiki pattern. I have decided this umbrella needs to be in my life. I love it so much. <laughs> So, so much. So much. (laughs) (laughs) How how much? So much. (laughs) I, uh, you know me, like when it comes to like apparel and stuff, uh, I do like the fact that it's got Jose on the handle. Uh, Although I kind of, for some reason, when I when I was thinking of the description of this with Jose on the handle, I thought of like Mary Poppins, like, you know, like like it's him upside down. But no, this is him right side up on his little perch. It looks like he's yeah, just hanging out with you on his perch. Yeah, you thought, oh, like it was the head. Yeah. Well, as we talked about a few weeks ago, the outdoor seating area for the Carthay Circle Lounge has been completed. The area is small, but fits in a few tables that are separated from the main guest flow by some potted plants. The outdoor seating also acts as a way to advertise to passing guests that a lounge exists inside. I think this turned out beautiful. I would love to just like on like an evening, go out there and sip a cocktail and watch the DCA world go by. I think this is just awesome i like the kind of like higher greenery that they have so you have a little bit of privacy um from the people just walking right past you but i just the colors it's just it's gorgeous it is Very gorgeous well done. Uh, i like the fact i know that it's always been there but i like the tile and stuff on the ground that go and it goes really well with the seats and everything that are there so uh we should eat here when we when yes we go. and there right there we're gonna eat on this little patio thing we can sip cocktails with appetizers. That's that's what this looks like it's intended for. There we go. 
Are you sure we have this in the budget? We're going to come back like broke. We're going to have to sell our homes. I'm not sharing my new tiki umbrella with you. Well, a friendly reminder that if you are going to be visiting the resort in the next few weeks, that grad nights will begin at the resort on May 10th. So if you're visiting on a grad night, get the most out of your day in the morning is really your best bet as the parks are going to get pretty crowded as the day goes on. I can 100% attest to this because when we were there, it was there were, I think, like, it was either every day we were there or most of the the most of the days that we were there. There was a grad night celebration each of those days. Um, or like I said, most of it. But the first day we were there, I was think I was thinking I was gonna check out Max Pass, but there was zero reason to. We walked on to so many attractions, it was nuts in the morning. So it was awesome. So yeah, just get there early. Apparently high school seniors apparently don't like mornings. <laughs> so well, something that is beat the rush. Well, so there's two reasons. One uh, the way that the tickets and stuff work, a lot of a lot of the students are bussing in that morning right? yeah. for that night, so they try to get their day in. The other thing too that that uh, is different than in years past, in the past, I should say, mm-hmm. not just years past, but the fact that it's held in California Adventure after the park closes is their grad night. So the parks, neither park closes necessarily earlier. I mean, I guess California. Well, no, California Adventure usually closes around ten anyway. Yeah. I'll so it goes from it. ten to two a.m. So unlike before, when it was just Disneyland and they'd close it early. Uh, they don't have to worry about that, at least. But it will be packed with with people. Um, also, in this in the same article, uh, they said that basically from spring break through June is going to be packed because not only do, because a lot of schools now are year round schools. Oh, so sure. you've got spring break, spring break, spring break. You've got like a summer break. You got all the grad nights. So it's just a busy time. Hmm. Well, there are a lot of options around the resort if you want to treat the special mother in your life for Mother's Day. Steakhouse 55, Storyteller's Cafe, PCH Grill, Goofy's Kitchen, and Napa Rose all have special offerings. To see a list of the offerings and how to book your reservation, check out the link in our show notes. There's a lot going on uh, for Mother's Day. Uh, We did um, on Mouse Kingdoms last night. There was a ton of stuff in Disney World. They're doing a ton of stuff at Disneyland. Um, They have things such as uh, special buffets for Mother's Day on that Sunday. They have a special breakfast uh, at Steakhouse 55. At Napa Rose, they have the princess breakfast adventures. So there's tons of options at all different price ranges and everything. Uh, And basically, uh, sooner rather than later, you should call and get these reservations for sure. Well, last week, the smoking ban went into effect. We wanted to update you if you needed a smoke break while visiting the park where you should go to do so. The official Disneyland app states that smoking is not allowed in Disneyland, California Adventure, Downtown Disney, or in the Esplanade. This leaves exiting security to find anywhere that you can smoke. So I was surprised. I, again, I'm I'm sorry to keep name dropping. It's just Mouse Kingdoms when we recorded last night. The smoking ban went into effect in Disney World as well. They, I looked up the maps and stuff for Disney World and Animal Kingdom, it's right outside the front gate. Magic Kingdom, it's over by the bus drop off. Well, so there's all these things that are kind of close. Disneyland is like in the app. When you look for smoking areas, they don't show them anywhere on the map. They just say it's not available anywhere. So like you zoom all the way out, nothing. I, that makes sense though, because think of how Disney World is set up versus Disneyland. Disneyland is right on top of each other. Disney World, you walk out and your ba- the parking lot's right there. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, you have to... So since everything's so smooshed together, there's not really space in between it. So where are you going to put them? In this dead center of the Esplanade and say that's your smoking area? No, you know? I, I would have thought that maybe what they would have done is that... So there's like the picnic area. I would have thought that like maybe next to the picnic area, they do like a small smoking area because that's kind of out of the way. It's kind of off to the side. It's It's got large trees that like could block smoke drifting around and hitting people in the face, that kind of thing. So I thought maybe something like that. Uh, but this is like, you have to go outside of security. And you yeah. know, and everybody who's been there recently knows, security's it's, a it's, challenge to get yeah. through. So uh, one of the recommendations somebody said was, basically, uh, leave your bags and everything with your party and just go out so you yeah. can at least come back in through the through the uh, line with the no, back, no bags line or whatever, mm-hmm. it'd be faster. I am so excited for this next story. And... And sad all at the same time. I have so many. <laughs> I have so many emotions. So many feels. Well, Mice Chat posted a rumor about changes that could be coming to Tomorrowland, and it does sound exciting. Rumored changes include installation of the popular Tron coaster that's in Shanghai Disneyland and coming to the Magic Kingdom in 2021. 
Finally, the removal of the people mover tracks, an unspecified change to Space Mountain, which I'm sure people are going to get up in arms about, and removal or shortening of the monorail and more. The Tron coaster would be the eye-catching feature to draw guests into the land from Main Street, with the monorail being removed to make room for a future Fantasyland addition. You know, I have all the feels about this, too. I think it's exciting that we're going to be getting potentially a new e-ticket style attraction, something big, exciting. I think that would also bring the movement back to Tomorrowland since this coaster is kind of, I don't know, more visible. It's not in a show building. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't, I don't know what they would do to change Space Mountain. Like, are they talking about it? We don't know. It's just a rumor. Would they change like the exterior or are they talking about changing the actual attraction itself? I I think it's the attraction. Changing the exterior, but I'm don't know how, like what you could do to the attraction itself. So I'm I'm skeptical and curious on that one. Yeah. Um, but the other thing that I think that is going to be, I'm a little, I'm sad about the monorail. I know the monorail is kind of, for me, it's more of an attraction, but still I'm sad about it. I get that where the track is placed is not maybe ideal for expansion. So I get why they're doing it as long as they don't take it away completely. But I am very sad about the people mover tracks. So here's what I will say. So this they need to go, but there's I'm sad. some. We are live streaming this, so there's some people in the chat talking about. Uh, they're excited about the removal of the people mover track, but they need to overhaul the whole land. They want to get rid of Autopia and the Astro Blasters. So here is what else the article said. So that uh, part of the read that I had that said and more. The general consensus at the moment, again, all of this could change. Disney announces d- announces and doesn't announce things, and things change. You know, they drop whole plans. They spend lots of money developing something, and then it ends up being something totally different. Oh, Westcott, for example. But this, we were talking about that earlier. Yeah, but this <laughs> rumor says that basically, other than Space Mountain, Tomorrowland's going to be leveled, and they're going to start over. I think, I think that needs to happen, but I don't know. The other thing, too, that I... I have feelings about i'm excited that there's a potential new i don't know i said i was excited about tron i don't know if i am though because we have it already it's it's somewhere else and i don't from what i've seen as to how you know what the coaster looks like in other parks i don't see how that would fit (laughs) because they're also talking about somehow having this towards the entrance to kind of draw people in and i don't see how i just I'm not an Imagineer, but I don't understand how that would work. Well, my my concern that I have for this, I like movement. That's what I my like concern it. that I have for this is. So let's let's take this at value, right? So they said mm-hmm. leveling the whole thing. So that means your entrance, technically, oh, I suppose your you got, entrance, your your gone. Star Tours would be gone, your uh, Astro, Astro Orbiter, Orbiter would, be would be gone, your People Mover tracks, your Astro Blasters, all that would be gone. And the thing that would worry me, though, is I've seen videos of the Tron coaster. It's kind of loud. It's a it's a roller coaster. Oh, Imagine yeah. that right there in in the hub. Yeah. Like, that's not going to be. I mean, people complain the fact that, like, the Astro Orbiter's there. The thing that was cool about the people mover being at the entrance was it was quiet. Like, you mm-hmm. saw it moving, but it didn't make a lot of noise. Sure. So sure. the fact that they're going to have this Tron coaster possibly roaring by Main Street kind of concerns me. I, you know, and I think this is my other thought too. I like roller coasters. I like e-tickets. But to me, now I haven't ever been on it, mind you. I the the Tron coaster doesn't really it's not very Disney to me. It's not immersive. It doesn't take me somewhere. It's just fast and fun. Yeah. So I want something themed. Like Space Mountain, it's a roller coaster, but I feel like I'm zipping through space while yeah. I'm on it. You know, it's 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 immersive, I guess would be a good way of saying it. I don't the Tron coaster to me doesn't feel immersive. It just feels fast and fun. It feels like something that perhaps belongs in a different park. Can we all agree that it's good that Disney's at least thinking about Tomorrowland for once? <laughs> That's true. Yeah, I'm very excited about that. We'll see what actually pans out. Maybe they won't because I don't know. I just feel like, I don't know. I just feel like there's a lot of potential there, a lot of untapped potential. And I'm sure there's so many different ideas from all of the Imagineers of if you could fix it, what would you do? How would you plus it? How would you make it better? So I'm sure there's tons and tons of ideas on the table. I'm not going to get too worried about this rumor because it is just that it's a rumor. Um, and I feel like it's a rumor because the Tron coaster's coming to Walt Disney World. So they assume, well, why not bring it to Disneyland too? But 
I don't know. I think that's what makes each park awesome is that it's not the same. It's not a copycat version. So yes, we're going to have some things that are the same in each park, but let's keep, I feel like I'm on my little soapbox right now, but let's keep each park unique. So you have a reason to visit each park. Cause really for me, what's the point in visiting say Walt Disney world, if I've experienced all the same things right. at Disneyland already. Right. I, I think that no, I, I think as long as they do something, first of all, the biggest thing that I want to say that I'm excited for is if it's true that they talk, they're talking about leveling a lot of this. I think yeah. that's what needs to happen. I think that to be able to have more flexibility to build great new attractions, oh, yeah, that they need, need to level stuff. Over. You can't be mm-hmm. shoehorning things into the existing locations. Um, one thing that angered me actually about this article on my chat was the fact that they reported on the fact that uh, the person, the reason the Astro Orbiter got taken off of the rocket jet tower yeah, yeah. and moved to the front was the imaginator that was put in charge of it was afraid of heights so he was like oh let me put it uh down low so i can imagine you're this thing you know whatever and now because the the tower has not been maintained they can't move it back up because it's too it's just like the people mover tracks it's just too brittle and stuff now but if they level everything whatever i i i know it won't happen but i wish they'd bring a version of a people mover back because I think that that would be great for Tomorrowland, but they probably won't. But that's just, I th- yeah, I, I think it'd say. be cool. I don't know. I think, I think if Tomorrowland would have kind of stayed the like the fifties version of what they thought the future was going to look like, it would have worked. Time will tell. Like I said, I'm just glad that they're at least thinking about Tomorrowland because for they, sure they hadn't 100%. been saying anything for a long time. So. Well, now we take a trip to Trivia Land, where producer James tries to stump us with Disney trivia. He's going to read us the question. We're going to attempt to answer them. And then he's going to give us the correct answers after the discussion topic. So what do you have for us this week, James? Well, this week we are, I'm taking some inspiration from when you turned the tables on me, and I'm going to ask you about a Toontown house. So we asked about a garden a couple weeks ago. But what's baking in Minnie's kitchen in Toontown? How specific do we have to be? Uh, I will accept the type of food that it is. Okay. I think, it, I don't know why, but it popped in my head bread. So I'm just going to say bread. I was going like completely, I don't know. I, I had two very extreme thoughts. My thirst, first thought was like a cake or a cupcake. And then for some reason, my brain went to like a ham. I have no idea why. <laughs> so what are you going to pick? I'm going to go with my gut and say like a cake or cupcakes. Okay. <laughs> Watch, it's ham. I like. I, I love the idea of it being a ham, whether it's true or not. All right, second question. I'll give you good odds. True or false? Oh, d- man. <laughs> <laughs> you are the only person I know that's disappointed about good odds. You have a 50-50 chance. I don't always do so well with those. <laughs> According to Guinness World Records, the Golden Horseshoe Review holds the record for the longest running stage show. True. I want to say true, but then I'm thinking that there was another show that was similar ish, kind of named. Or maybe it wasn't that show. Maybe it was just the dude did the amount. Hmm. Can, you, can you go with that word again? What was that word? <laughs> Similarly ish. <laughs> Let's see. I'm going to say true. What the heck? All right, question number three this week. This one comes from Daniel. Name the type of tiny trees planted along the Storybook Land oh. Canal. Bonsai. You think there's something else, though, huh? Bonsai is the only thing I can think of that's like a small tree, and I feel like it's those, but but I feel like maybe it's not, because that seems like it'd be too obvious. I mm, I think... Mm, mm. I don't think they're bonsai. Like, okay. Speci- well, bonsai is like the art. Well, they're bonsai. Tr- I, I will tell you, bonsai is a type of tree. Oh, good. Okay. okay. I'm going to go with bonsai because I don't know any other trees that are <laughs> tiny. But I don't think that's right. I think it's something else. Okay. All right. Our last question, which comes from Dylan H. And this is based on an experience he had on the Disneyland Railroad. Mm. So as he was traveling from Toontown to Tomorrowland, he noticed a familiar song playing underneath the safety <gasps> announcement. What was the song? This is the only reason I know this song because I've not seen the attraction in Walt Disney World. Is it uh, what the heck? Is, what's it called? A great big beautiful yes. tomorrow. <laughs> is that what it's called? <laughs> I was going to start singing it. It's a great 
perfect, beautiful tomorrow. I'm going to steal her answer because that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> well, this week for our discussion topic, we're going to talk about something that was actually voted on by you guys on our website at dlweekly.net. Uh, the club, th- well, the, the topic was Club 33, but we're going to talk about the history of Club 33, which... I feel like there's a lot here that people know, and there's a lot here that people don't know. <laughs> so, well, no, I mean, there's stuff so that So we're going to talk about it all. That, well, I think there's a lot of stuff that people just know from, you know, that they take as fact and they've known for a long time. Like, it's got a huge long waiting list. It's very expensive and exclusive to get oh, into. Oh, sure. The address is, thir- uh, not anymore, though. The address 33 was 33 Royal. Royal Street, but is now 33 Orleans Street when they moved the entrance to the Court of Angels. It is now 33 Orleans Street. <laughs> But I got a question on that because when I was there last year, I remember I was so excited. Yeah, you got that because, picture of like inside the door. Yeah, and that was 33 Royal. That that was the door that was open was 33 Royal. Right. But that's not really the entrance anymore. They, but they were letting people in it. <laughs> that Maybe that's the still exit still one now. of the most like exciting Disneyland memories ever. The, I nerded out way too much for that. So we just so happened to be walking down... Well, Royal Street. Mm-hmm. And I was actually going to the restroom after Fantasmic had finished. And um, I was already riding high because we just sat f- literally front row, got soaked and heated on and heated on, whatever, you know, the flames and all that. Awesome. Super awesome experience because they're front row for Fantasmic. I decided I wanted to go run to the restroom. And oh, yeah, there's, you know, there's some back around here. So I went against the crowd and went the way the crowds weren't going. And in doing so, I realized this is a great time. I learned something. That's a great time to get a peek into Club 33 because a lot of Club 33 members come out. They had, I think they had special seating even for Fantasmic. And then they were going back into the club afterwards. So I w- got to see them re-entering the club. And for some reason, there was something going on at the front door or at the door. And she had that thing wide open. And I could see it was like, for some reason, it was tiki themed. I don't remember what... We had reported on that, how they had moved some tiki stuff. And I don't remember what the deal was, but they had um, some anim- some of the animatronic birds from the tiki room on display in that front yeah. room. And so when I was peeking in, I could see those the birds in there. It was very, very cool. Very cool. I, I am envious because I have not seen that, but maybe we'll see it when we're there in August. Well, now we know a secret that maybe, I don't know, maybe it was a fluke. Maybe it'll happen again. I don't know. We'll find out. So much lore exists to how the restaurant got its name. So there's actually three different stories. I always thought it was pretty cut and dry, but apparently it's not. So some say that the restaurant was named after the original 33 investors in Disneyland who Walt would entertain at the restaurant. So the whole like oh, reason for uh-huh. it being there. Others have suggested the name refers to the number of yay votes for the proceeding with the club after Walt's death. So Walt passed away and... Uh, it it opened and was created after he had passed away. So they were saying that 33 people voted yes to do it. Uh, uh, yet others uh, think it's because the 33 sideways looks like Mickey Mouse. Another rumor is that it represents like the number M-M of... Like M.M. for Mickey Mouse. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, another one is that it represents the number of Disneyland lessees in the 1966-67 when the club was being built. Uh, and then the real one, the official one, the one that everybody goes by is the fact that it is... 33 Royal Street. That is the official line from Disney. If you ask why it is called Club 33, that is why. Uh, One of the other things that I think um, a lot of people do know is it is the only place in Disneyland that serves alcohol. Well, currently. (laughs) Right now, it is the only place in Disneyland that does serve alcoholic beverages. However, we do know that that will be changing once the cantina in Galaxy's Edge opens. Now, We talked a couple weeks ago about the 1964-65 World's Fair, Mm -hmm. and that's actually where the idea for Club 33 came from, because Walt was able to go into these VIP lounges set up by all of these different companies, and he liked that idea. He wanted to be able to bring people into this new New Orleans Square that he was building and be able to uh, basically have people to his park that he wanted to show off and have a beautiful place, a restaurant that people could come to and could have a great meal and be very, uh, very high class. So uh, I actually did not know that. I thought that like he just wanted to make a cool restaurant. But uh, uh, in research for this, that is what we figured out. Now, you know, for those of us that have not been in the club, um, it is it is a very lavish, very just extravagant, very... 
I, I don't even know how to describe it. It almost, from the photos that I've seen, it almost looks like you're taking a step back in time. When you go into Club 33, it is the, the decor in there. It looks very, for some reason, it reminds me of the 20s. I don't know why specifically, but it just kind of that it old feels loungy. that like old loungy, but just very high class. It's definitely an experience. You know, I don't think you're a member of Club 33 unless you're there for the experience. I feel like there's probably, there's got to be a lot of like Disney history nerd type people that are also Club 33 members. Oh, yeah. It's rich, very, very rich in history. Yeah. So there's actually, we're going to split this up into two sections because there's a lot of history and we're going to talk about what is in club 33 and up until 2014 the club was one way and then it had gone through an extensive remodel and came out way different than it was before so in the beginning we're going to talk about how it was when it was designed originally before this remodel so originally uh, it had two dining rooms and several adjoining areas, all of which held a wide array of antiques and original works of art. So Walt Disney was a fan of all this kind of stuff and wanted to have um, you know different artwork and stuff on display. One of the coolest things uh, that... It, it, <laughs> so he was going to have dignitaries. He was going to have all these corporate people there. And one of the cool things that he did was he wanted these audio animatronic animals in there. Oh, yeah. And he had microphones installed in the chandeliers to listen in on the conversations that these people mm -hmm. would would be having so two reasons one he had it so the audio animatronic characters could talk with his guests but he also had it so he could hear listen in on what his guests were saying about things and kind of uh you know kind of espionage it i guess a little bit <laughs> uh but uh in fact not in the, not since it got remodeled but before you could actually go in and look up and they had disconnected them but you could still see the microphones in the chandeliers so um there are it is it isn't just you it isn't you just go in and it's just one big grand room. There are kind of I don't know, like little separate rooms and hallways. It kind of feels like like you're visiting like a house or like a, an estate, I guess sure. would be a good way of saying it. So when you first enter, you're you're in like this lobby area and that's the area that I got to like take a little sneak peek into, which um when I saw it was decorated in like a tiki theme and um in our chat we were talking about it, they think we think that they do the tiki theme either yearly or frequently. It was so cool looking, though. Um, anyways, but um, one of the coolest thing things that is in there is something called a French lift, which were actually used back in the 1800s and are obviously very, very rare. Um, and actually, they were pretty rare when Club 33 was being constructed and thought up um but the kind of story behind the french lift is when walt and lillian were shopping in france um they had to have an older hotel and he tried to purchase the elevator from the older hotel <laughs> um, walt disney what a guy but they wouldn't they wouldn't sell it to him which i think is funny because everyone you know everyone nowadays is like but it was walt disney asking for it you know but anyways um Walt had engineers and artists visit the hotel, study the lift, and they actually, um, it's a replica. But it's so, so cool. It's one of those things that um, a lot of people that, you know, are into the, you know, into the deep, deep history of Disney. It's kind of one of those, like, like you like must sees. It's a Disney bucket list item, I think, for a lot of people. So it, it is a really, really cool, very awesome piece of history and i think it's just so funny and so walt that he saw it and he said i want that and they said no you can't have it and he said fine i'm gonna build my own <laughs> well and so uh, before the remodel you'd come into this lobby area and there would be this lift here and they would ask you would you like to take the stairs would you like to take the lift i can't imagine not taking the lift like the lift right? is like yeah. i feel like an essential part of the it club was, yes it was experience. it was a working lift it wasn't just there for show so after you go up the lift, basically, uh, you get into the the lounge alley is what it's called. So you go up, you get out of the French lift, and you're greeted by the hostess or maitre d', maitre d there. And then you would go down this kind of hallway, and there were some pictures. There's a picture, a historic pictures of Walt working on an early animation cell and uh, him with the Oscars that he had. And then as you go down lounge alley, uh, you kind of, there's the booth and everything there. And of course, there's more artwork. Of course, the the wallpaper in this area was uh, a gold design on a white background. Very, very fancy looking, especially for the time. There's original costume designer artwork 
for Babes in Toyland that were that was there and for Mary Poppins. So lots of history in Club 33. Lots and lots and lots of history. Um, there's also this uh, print of Walt Disney enjoying breakfast. It's actually in Club 33 uh, that was done by Charles Boyer. And uh, he passed, Walt Disney passed prior to the club being open, but the print is very sentimental to staff members because it's like him enjoying it, even though he was never able to enjoy it. Uh, so there's a bunch more like art and drawings and stuff on the wall, which is super nice. There's an antique foyer table that was used in Mary Poppins. Again, like treasure trove of yeah. stuff. You can see the stretching portraits that are also found within the Haunted Mansion. Smaller versions, though. I just... Mm. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of artwork. There's some artwork there from Pirates of the Caribbean. The, so, the concept art from, for the Haunted Mansion that was drawn by Sam McKinn in 1958, um, which was that kind of original, very creepy, eerie looking. And what the... It's, it's a very well-known image. I don't know how to describe it. Very well-known. It's got all the like mossy oh, the trees. Yes, the Haunted Mansion concept art I have that is also hanging bathroom. in there. Mm-hmm. As you go down the whole, uh, as you go down this hallway, you end up coming across uh, something that wasn't there on opening day, but was there up until the remodel. And they had this bar located just before you get to the main dining room. So this bar, kind of a small bar, uh, and basically you can get some drinks and stuff there. Uh, and they they have a bartender hanging out and waiting for for guests that need to come and do that stuff. They have a good variety of liquor and stuff there that you can get before going into the main dining room. So one of the most iconic places in Club 33 is the trophy room. And the trophy room had all different types of props and things in this room uh, that is is just amazing. There's a uh, rifle that was signed by Fess Parker, who was Davy Crockett. There's also a Pinot, bottle of Pinot Noir that he signed as well that's on display. There's a lot of pictures of Disneyland. Uh, there's a famous picture of M- Walt sitting on the bench in, um, in the town square. Uh, and there's some butterflies. The butterflies are actually there because Lillian had a uh, like a butterfly collection that she was kind of doing. It, it also with. talks about, this is awesome, it talks about um, some of the microphone screens that you can still see in the chandeliers mm-hmm. that are in this area as well. Yeah. There's a dining table there too. Um, different trophy cases with... All sorts of different Disney memorabilia. This uh, to me, the this area is very, very much dedicated to Walt. Definitely. And and the one of the most famous things that I think a lot of people do know about Club Thirty Three is the animatronic vulture, mm-hmm. and he is still located in the trophy room. Um, so yeah, he's kind of the the star, if you would, of the trophy room. Um, And he was an an animatronic. He's a California turkey vulture. Um, He was designed to talk with guests while they dined. Um, There was an actor that was actually hidden in a sound room that would control the vulture and listen into the guest conversations through the hidden microphones that were in the different lighting fixtures. Um, The screens covering the mics are still in the lights or the lamps and the lighting fixtures, but the wires on the mics have a have been removed and the vulture now just sits perched in his corners um he and he just kind of eyes eyes the diners as they're eating they, he doesn't mm-hmm. he does not move around and interact with guests anymore so now once you get into the main dining room so this is where most people are going to eat dinner basically uh before the remodel and basically it had dark wood gold accents beautiful window covering they had new chairs uh, so uh, it's kind of a cramped space. Uh, you know, it's not it's not huge. There's only a few tables in there, of course. You know, how many Club 33 guests are you going to have in at one time, I suppose? Mm-hmm. Uh, but the, it's very, very upscale looking, but also very classic looking, you know, very, very it's 1960s. Timeless. Yeah, and it's just yeah. kind of timeless looking. Very lavish, though. I just, that's a, the, the best word I can use for this place. It's just so lavish. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. Over the top, but just very extravagant. So one of the things that people talk about with Club 33, funny enough, is the fact that they have uh, amazing bathrooms. So <laughs> of the, course. the men's lavatory uh, has like some marble countertops. It's got some great... Uh, wallpaper going on. It's all says Club 33 on it. So it's definitely something that you probably would take as a souvenir with you if you were in there. <laughs> um, 
and they're maintained to the highest standards of cleanliness. So they make sure that it is checked frequently so you don't ever have to worry about uh, any type of mess or anything in there. In the ladies' lavatory, there's actually uh, there was actually a desk there with like a like a powder powder desk that they mm-hmm. could sit at and enjoy. Uh, so there's definitely, I mean, it's definitely very fancy and very cool. Uh, in fact, the ladies' even the, restroom is very pink, uh, very pink. Why don't you talk about the toilet? <laughs> I don't in even. The ladies' room. I don't even know what to say about that. I saw that photo and I just I don't even know what. to it looks like, like it looks a regular like a chair. chair. <laughs> yes, it does. It looks it looks like a chair. Um, it like a wicker chair, I guess, would be the best way for me to describe that. It has like a a chair back. There is not like a tank behind it, like a traditional toilet. Right. And then the the cover of it is square and looks like a chair seat. Hopefully, nobody gets confused by this, and they they remember to lift the seat before sitting. Um, but it's the most non looking toilet i think i've ever seen <laughs> yeah i so, was i was a little confused by it <laughs> as much as we love vintage club 33 i think it's time to talk about what you'd see there now unfortunately i guess uh it is very different than it was so the original entrance remains in the same location since 1967 the original doorway remains intact with the same club 33 logo outside but the new entrance is 15 yards to the west across from crystal de orleans and so basically, this is the area kind of uh, by uh, the Court of Angels, uh, as it were. So uh, they got new light fixtures, that kind of stuff. And then you've got like a little box that you can um, communicate with. There's a, a, you know, the new Club 33 logo. The entrance now is a lot brighter. They still got some really cool wallpaper, but it's definitely more modern looking. So it's definitely still classic, but it looks modern. A, a oh, lot more mar- so modern beautiful. than it did. I think they did a nice job. I think they they captured the like the lavishness and the elegance of what it was, but they just kind of it 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 seems brighter to me. The, the club decor before was it's very dark. There's a lot of deep rich burgundies and blues, mm-hmm. and now it's it's just it's lighter. It doesn't seem so um, dark and not. I don't want to say dingy, but just it was it the decor in there. It was one of those places when you went in, you couldn't tell if it was day or nighttime because it was just a very a very dark secluded feeling, which is kind of nice. Little mm-hmm. home away from home, but I do I do like this. Now we've actually been talking about this in our supporter chat a lot recently, which is the Court of Angels uh, is something that has been lost because of this expansion. And they made it a nice spot for people waiting for their dinner reservation or whatever at Club 33 to go and enjoy. This area was refurbished everything um, during it. It is very beautiful. It was a very quiet, nice corner of New Orleans Square that is now only for Club 33 guests. Uh, There are some pictures. Again, we'll link this in our show notes, but uh, that whole area is very gorgeous. Uh, and that's how you kind of get up and into Club 33 now after you kind of get uh, enter, basically. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So the entrance is now on the second story above the Court of Angels. Um, so you get to go up that beautiful staircase. And there is also an elevator, too, if you need. The thing that I really love is they have this beautiful, like, tile mosaic, mm-hmm. kind of like a welcome mat yeah. shape, I guess. But it's of the Club 33 logo. And it's got this very brilliant blue. It's... It's very, very nicely done. It is very nicely done. Now, if if you went to the show notes and you're following along with the pictures, uh, I will say the entrance area now where the host or hostess gets you is much bigger than the one that was previously there. I mean, it's very open, very light. Uh, the, the walls are light blue. There's big open windows. There's some beautiful decorative flooring, some chandeliers with the Club 33 logo in it. They're, but very tasteful. But and look what made it over. Yes, our friend the Turkey Vulture has found a new roost. He is now in the entranceway, and he's... I. I don't know, kind of on top of the, it's like a big grandfather clock Mm -hmm. looking piece, right? Actually, right near the entrance. And even more exciting, he is now animated again. Um, So if you, you know, if you do happen to be lucky enough and fortunate enough to get to go to Club 33, he may speak to you at some point. I feel, does he have a name? I feel like if he doesn't have a name, we should give him one. I California turkey vulture is the only thing I assume he might have a name, but I don't see it anywhere. Yeah, we need to bet Cal. We'll call him Cal. Um, <laughs> call him Cal. 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 Okay. Um, the harpsichord, um, which was original, is still part of the interior decor. Um, it, the lid is open, and inside of the lid, it does have this gorgeous 
gorgeous painting of the New Orleans Harbor in it. Just a very beautiful piece. One of those things that I would be afraid to like accidentally bump. <laughs> right. Well, there's some beautiful stained glass uh, around the club, which is super nice. Uh, there's some more murals within the club that kind of go along with uh, it kind of, you know, goes along with the painting that was inside mm-hmm. the harpsichord. Uh, again, uh, the with the remodel, they put in these beautiful giant windows that bring in a lot of natural light. Uh, and so there's a lot of murals along that natural light, which really makes that stuff pop. So definitely not as dark and kind of cramped feeling as the original. So if you go online to the link in our show notes and you look at the vintage photos of Club 33 and you look at the new photos, there's a huge, very, almost very bright, almost and literal night and day difference. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other cool thing, too, is the entrance table from Mary Poppins is still in the um, in the new version of the club. It, you know, I like how they have this because it looks they have a photo of Mr. Banks with the children with this end table in the back next to it. So you can clearly see. Oh, yep. That's definitely the same because honestly, it's it, to me, it's not a standout piece. I don't think I would have been able to point that out and knew, know what that was just by seeing it. Um, so that's really cool that they've got that there. Um, all sorts of very beautiful Club 33 merchandise that you could purchase and take home with you, too, if you so choose. But it's just, yeah, like Tag said, it, the, it is such the old the old version of the club was neat in its own way. But this is just so it's very more light and open feeling, I guess would be a good way of saying it, but still very lavish. So now this is really interesting too. So one new area of the Club 33 since the remodel has been the Le Salon Nouveau, which is kind of interesting. So when they, when the imagine, when the animators at the Disney studios went to storyboard board, the princess and the frog, they went to actual New Orleans, super cool, but they also visited cafe Orleans within Disneyland to study the architecture. From the imaginative interior of Cafe Orleans, they created Tiana's Place, as seen in the movie. And when they began drafting the interior of the Le Salon Nouveau, they returned to the Princess of the Frog artwork and found inspiration to create this new lounge. So you kind of enter the area. There is a uh, stocked array of wine closets that look super cool. Again, this this is a little more cramped looking than, uh, uh, you know, more kind of hearkening back to the old kind of uh, design here. Yeah, but it's like a wine. It looks like a wine cellar. I think this is just, I, I'm okay with this. It's just the, you know, the hallway to get there. Because once you get to the bar, the bar holy is amazing. Holy cow. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. Absolutely beautiful. The colors that they used in here are just very vibrant, very gorgeous. It's, it's unlike anything I've seen before. There's a piano in there. There's some nice booth seating. There's some beautiful stained glass windows along the ceiling of this area. It's very jazz club feeling. Uh, of course, the original French lift has been restored and resides in the lounge. It is a small area where you can sit like like a date night, like two mm-hmm. of you could possibly sit there. Mm-hmm. I'm still very sad that this is not I the would, lift. Yeah, I would have liked to have experienced it as the lift. I do think it's neat that they did still, that it's still around and that they kept it. They could have just, it could have gotten sold off in an auction someplace. So I do like that it is still part of the club. Les Salon Nouveau. Looks amazing. I would love mm-hmm. to just kind of hang out in there. The next place we're going to visit is the Le Grand Salon, which is the main dining room. And this has also gone uh, over a huge remodel. Uh, in fact, if you are in Disneyland and you are below Cafe Orleans and you look up and there's a big picture window, that mm-hmm. inside behind that window is this dining room. I don't even know what to say about it. It's gorgeous. <laughs> it is gorgeous. It still keeps with the theme. It's very, very bright, very open feeling. Lots and lots of windows up in this dining area that, you know, look out over New or- the New Orleans Square area, which in my opinion is one of the, it's just a very nice, very classy part of the park. Um, but it's just beautiful. It's The decor in here is a little bit more simple, though. I feel like it's, it's a little bit more... Um, Simple, but yet very elegant. And this, it seems the decor here kind of pays more respect to um, like the Rivers of America and the um, the Mark Twain Riverboat, yeah. that kind of decor. More New so. Orleans and Rivers of America. Yeah, yeah. whereas I felt like the um, Salon Nouveau was kind of more like pirates and um, there was, it had pirate decor in there. Sure. It also had some like Haunted Mansion style decor plus the jazz stuff, whereas this is more of the river theming i guess would be a good way to say that 
but lots of blues. It's got a checkerboard styled um, flooring, white tablecloths. Um, the chairs are have that wicker back, wooden with the wicker back, and then the um, seat cushion themselves is mostly white with a, with some um, blue accents on it. But very gorgeous. Now the ladies' lavatory, because we love talking about the bathrooms. Uh, this looks gorgeous still, even though it was totally remodeled. The fixtures uh, for the sinks look amazing. Uh, there's uh, the the mirror and everything that's in here it's looks amazing. It's not so pink. Yeah, and then <laughs> the you could pink even, went away. You could even sit down and read a book in the lavatory. Apparently, is they got kind of like a little yeah. There's area like a there. little lounge cat. Like, what is that? It's like a chaise lounge that's in there too. Yes, <laughs> but did you see the sinks? They look almost like like swans or something. They've got like these little like winged fixtures on the neck of the faucet that almost that just make it that much more elegant um we do not have a photo of what the toilets look no. like so hopefully they got rid of the wicker chair look that they had but before people liked that they thought that was charming well, I'm not so sure in about the that. men's <laughs> lavatory we have the books that you need to go lay in the chase lounge because we've got a, a bookshelf in the men's oh, room. Oh, so you need to be polite to the opposite sex. Apparently. And make sure that, that you've got half of what you need in each restaurant. Right. So the, <laughs> so the decor in the men's room is granite, dark woods, and a vintage style tile and fixtures. Uh, definitely a lot darker than the women's room mm-hmm. and the rest of the the rest of the area. Uh, it does look very nice, though. Uh well, we got pictures. Well, there's the men's room toilet. Yes, Looks just it, like a it regular doesn't have toilet. a wicker chair, but it does have that Pole that string. old that old style tank where it's like practically up to the ceiling, and it has like an old the pull chain style to flusher. All Very right. unique. Now that we've talked this up forever, uh, how would you join Club Thirty Three? That is the question. Up on well, the well, you need to give them your firstborn child uh, and your second, and all your, second your children, and your third. <laughs> Wow, it is so so fancy. It's a written application process. Um, requires a lot, a lot of patience because there are only so many memberships that are offered each year. Um, sometimes there are no memberships offered that year because it all depends on how many people re-up their memberships. Um, but first, you must submit a written letter of inquiry to the to their address, which is Club 33 Member Services, 1600 South Disneyland Drive in Anaheim, California. And then as memberships become available, the management team will reach out and contact you. Um, it is a very formal affair, and guidelines are in place to assist in expediting your membership. I just love that you have to write in for this. It's just so, so fancy. It is very fancy. I was trying to find, because they had it on here before. Uh, So as of 2013, there are two types of membership levels available. It changes annually. Contact club management for current offerings and specific details. But the first one is a business membership type. So it includes corporate, limited corporate, and executive. So business memberships is maintained by one charter member, but is owned by the charter member's company. And so basically, uh, you can allow, basically, this is good for allowing, you know, uh, people that are in your corporation to be able to go and, and reap, reap kind of the benefits. The other one is an individual member type, uh, which is uh, everything is platinum memberships. Uh, so they get they maintain a one charter member and they may have up to three VIP card holders. They're part of the inv- individual membership to which they belong, but are not considered a member and do not have annual dues. The initiation fees and dues are applicable to each individual membership type. Per the current fee schedule, the charter member is responsible for payment of the annual fees now the fees uh i feel like they've changed everywhere but i believe i gotta gotta find this it was in one of the articles i had that talked about how much it cost to join as of 2011 there was a 14-year waiting list for new memberships uh it was reopened in may 2012 after being closed for five years corporate members pay an initiation fee of forty thousand dollars and individual members pay twenty five thousand dollars in addition to annual dues which are about $10,000. You also have to pay to eat and stuff there. Mm -hmm. So you're paying just to, that money is just to get the privilege, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other thing that you get as benefits is um, you basically can ride along in the Lily Bell, which is something that regular guests used to be able to do, but can't anymore. The other thing too to kind of mention is, I think this is interesting because think of what you would wear 
for your normal Disneyland day and what kind of attire you might choose to wear mm-hmm. to be comfortable throughout the day. Well, Club 33 does have a dress code and it's they're trying to retain the high standards and the elegant ambiance. Um, so this is just really interesting to me. So um, for lunch, guests may come in fashionable casual attire um, so that they can enjoy the club, but then also enjoy activities in the Disneyland Resort as well. Sure. But no tank tops, cutoffs, swimsuits, bare midriff, sweatpants, flip flops, or sandals, or any sort of like beachwear type th- clothing may be worn. Um, walking length shorts are acceptable and jeans are acceptable. Both are only acceptable if they are covering you completely so you don't have any undergarment showing and that they aren't you know like frayed or torn looking so they have to be very nice jeans and very nice shorts um they do have a separate dress code for evening and um how do I, for gentlemen, collared shirts and slacks are appropriate. And for ladies, an informal dress or pants with a blouse are appropriate. So the club actually does not allow you to wear any shorts for their dinner service. So right. It's a little bit more fancy for dinner. Well, I mean, for the, you know, the, the class of people I think that they're trying to get in mm-hmm. here, I think that's totally appropriate. Um, one of the other things with membership that you get to is you do get access uh, into the park. You don't have to buy tickets and stuff because that's part of your, uh, basically that's part of your fee is that you can bring people into the park and you can get into the park as well. Uh, I will say one cool thing is for the longest time, this was obviously the only place in Disneyland that was allowed to sell alcohol. Yeah, mm-hmm. And that's why they had the address of 33 Royal street mm-hmm. because it was an actual street in Anaheim the, for their liquor license. The, for their liquor license, because mm-hmm. he didn't want Disneyland's address on the liquor license. Although that is now going to be changing uh, with Galaxy's Edge and, and all that. So uh, the other thing is, it used to be the only Club 33 around. And now Walt Disney World, they're doing a Club 33 in each of the different parks. And they're kind of expanding membership to over there. Um, the Are other they thing, all going to be called Club 33? They're all under Club 33. That's a bummer. Yeah. The other thing that's cool is because of the long wait list for Club 33, that is the reason when California Adventure opened in the car, or when California Adventure mm-hmm. had the remodel of Buena Vista Street and they built Carthay Circle, uh, the Carthay Circle restaurant, there is a Club 1901, which people could opt to become a member of that because that is also a fancy exclusive restaurant. Mm-hmm. So Located in California Adventure. Correct. Mm-hmm. See, now... They should do that for Disney World. You you can have these exclusive clubs in Disney World too. Just don't call them Club Thirty Three. But you get the fancy exists. name with it. I think but is 1901 what they're going for. Nineteen oh one has its own name. That's you have true. Thirty three, nineteen oh one. So they could. They're creative. I'm sure they could find other things to call the clubs in Florida. Well, if any of you have had the privilege or oh. um, the the I don't know I don't even know what to say. Like, or if anybody not, listening has, yeah has anybody experience club 33 i think it's an experience you don't just visit it you experience club Teresa, i'm gonna go a step further and i'm gonna do a shameless thing here and i'm gonna say if there's anybody listening that has access to club 33 and will be around in august they want to get us into <laughs> club 33 we would and be more than happy to, to complete do this. piles of disney nerds that just are too amazed and just don't know what to do with themselves. I got super crazy excited just to get the little peek inside the door. I don't know what would happen if they would have let me like take one step in. <laughs> We've had a lot of amazing things happen with Very this show. Cool. You never know if somebody well, can get us in Club 33. And if anybody has had the pleasure of yes. being able to experience it for themselves, we would love to hear your stories, what you thought, if you have photos. Yes. Love to hear what your experience was with that. So make sure you either um, get a hold of us on one of the social on one of our social medias. We have Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Otherwise you can always email us at feedback at dlweekly.net and let us know about your experience. We would love to hear it. We would love to hear about it. Well, if you're going to be in the park soon and want to be wearing some DL Weekly swag, head on over to dlweekly.net slash store to pick some up. So now it's time for Teresa to pull out who's going to get a free piece of merch this month. All right, all right, all right. Okay. This one seems like a good one. (laughs) Congratulations to Michael Philly. We'll be in contact with you, Michael P., and see what merch you would like to choose from our merch store. Congratulations. Do you want to show it off on the camera? Mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. 
We hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of DL Weekly. You can support the show for as little as 25 cents an episode. If you want access to our supporter chat that we're always talking about, it's only 75 cents an episode. So please consider joining awesome supporters like Bob, a.k.a. Ace, and head over to dlweekly.net slash support. Well, now it's time to return to James and Trivia Land to get the answers to this week's trivia. I hope we did good, but I I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. Fingers crossed, as always. Time will tell. All right. Our first question for this week was, what is baking in Minnie's Kitchen in Toontown? And I said bread. And I went with a cake. And you should have listened to the supporter chat. It is a cake. Oh, <laughs> Teresa got a point. What type of cake? Is, is it, it just pink? a cake? I don't know. I just thought it's cake. We'll have to do some research I later. I didn't go with my second guess of ham. <laughs> I don't know why I it was thought a, that. It was a ham cake? It was a ham cake. A ham cake. There oh, you go. Gross. <laughs> All right, second question was the true or false. According to Guinness World Records, the Golden Horseshoe Review holds the record for the longest-running stage show. And I think we both said true. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is a long-winded answer, so bear with me. So if you ask the Disney playoff where I got this question, it's a cut-and-dry true. And it did earn that honor in 2004 after over 47,000 performances were logged in the 30-year run of the show, but the Guinness website now seems to point to more Broadway-style shows for the title, like The Fantastics, which had a run of more years than the Golden Horseshoe Review, but half the number of performances. So a bit of controversy, but my source of the question says it's true. The what? The Fantastics? What is I've never that? Heard of it. Oh, it's the longest-running Broadway show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, sort of <laughs> off Broadway. So oh, I much. thought you were saying in Disneyland. No. Okay, that's what I was like. I've never heard of this, and I felt like I have failed our listeners. <laughs> <laughs> no. Off so, Broadway show. do we get a point? Then? Take, take we the get point. A point. Okay. The Disney Play app says that's that that's true. the thing. That's true. So, it's the longest one in Disneyland. Oh yeah, and it, oh, it has sure, sure, significantly down. more performances than than the other shows too, but not necessarily the time frame. So, all right. Question three uh, from Daniel: Name the type of tiny trees planted along the Storybook Land Canal. And we both said bonsai. Yeah. But and, not bonsai. Yeah, My the, answer, bonsai, but it's not that. <laughs> yeah, you said, your answer, I think, was more like bonsai? <laughs> and it's crazy because Daniel had some foresight for this. The trees along the Storybook Land Canal are dwarf pine trees and not, as many believe, bonsai trees. Mm-hmm. Bonsai trees they- were more expensive and require considerable more maintenance. See, I knew all of that but not what the name of the tree was. Dwarf I knew, pine. Yep, I knew that it was too expensive. I should have said this, so it doesn't sound like I'm just copying you now. I knew it was too expensive and that it was too much maintenance. I remember mm. he, I remember reading that, but I don't remember what the heck they were called. And that was from Dwarf Daniel? Pine. I that feel like that's going to be burned into my memory. Thanks, Daniel. Yeah, you learned something for sure tonight. Yes, so. thank you, Daniel. All right, and then our last question now, this Dylan's week. Dylan's question, right? From Dylan, yes. From his experience as he traveled on the Disneyland Railroad from Toontown to Tomorrowland, he noticed a familiar song playing underneath the announcement. What was the song? It's, it's a, a great, great big, big, beautiful, beautiful tomorrow. tomorrow. I'm going to give it to you. It's an instrumental version of that of that song. But that's, that's Did the we have to answer. say it was instrumental? No. Okay. That was bonus points. <laughs> <laughs> Teresa, you got three points this week. I did? Whoop, whoop. Wow. What a great I'm going to give myself week. a half point for knowing that Bonsai wasn't right. <laughs> <laughs> bonsai, not Bonsai. Man, if bonsai you could do that every week. The bonsai. I'm going to say this, but I'm wrong, so I'm going to get a half point yeah. for it. No, this isn't right. We would be so much better than we, we are. We would. <laughs> oh. Well, if you have trivia that you would like to send me to Stump, Tag, and Teresa, you can send me an email at trivia at dlweekly.net. Well, we will be back next week with more Disneyland news and information. So until then, go out and enjoy the parks. Ladies and gentlemen, Disneyland has now ended its normal operating day. We hope you've enjoyed your visit to the Magic Kingdom and that you'll be back with us again soon.